Okay, so last week I just finished reading and reviewing Dress Rosa, and normally when I talk about an arc, I like to talk about the storyline, the character arcs, the themes. Just really trying to appreciate the writing of One Piece. And there are a lot of smaller moments that are cool, but that I don't have a lot to say besides that. And I don't know if people want me to really uh, just point out something and say, hey, that's, that's pretty cool with nothing else to add. But I got a bunch of comments telling me that, hey, I should point at stuff and say, hey, that's pretty cool. For example, one of the things that I learned recently is that, yes, the Dress Rosa arc in the manga is over 100 chapters long. But for some reason, the anime version of Dress Rosa is over 100 episodes long. Like, I think it's longer than the manga. And I think that mostly comes down to reaction shots and flashbacks. Personally, I think the Colosseum could have been like the place if you really wanted to. It could have been the place where you could have stretched out the anime, right? Like the Colosseum could have been like a tournament arc. There's so many characters in Dress Rosa that just didn't get any screen time. And if there is ever a place for them to get screen time, it would be in this tournament arc. Tournament arcs are like the place for shonen character development. We could, we could have had a tournament arc. Could this have derailed the story a bit? Perhaps. Did we already derail it by making it over 100 episodes long? You bet we did. Why not just full send it? That is a terrible idea. Anyways, one of the things that I didn't really talk about much in my Dress Rose overview were the Colosseum fights, because honestly, they didn't really add uh, too much to the story, but they were good fights. The Colosseum fights were great. Especially Lucy versus the giant when we first step up in the Colosseum. We see Lucy uh, just riding the bull around everywhere. He's like crushing everything within his path. And then all of a sudden, bam, he crashes into this giant who just smashes him on the floor. And so, of course, we see Lucy stand and just shrug it off because, you know, he's made out of rubber. And it gives us a pretty empathetic moment that I think even like the Colosseum people are able to see and be like, oh, wow, interesting. That's a weird thing to do in a Colosseum fight where everyone's like trying to kill each other. And so we get this amazing money shot in the Colosseum where Lucy jumps up and squares up against the giant and is able to just deck him, leaving like a full on mark on his helmet. So speaking of giants, it reminded me that kings are like a pretty big thing in this arc. There are, of course, like a lot of real kings that entered the Colosseum. Riku used to be a king. Of course, the whole princess plotline is a thing. We got Brook who wanted to be Soul King. Usopp got Sniper King. The giant wanted to be King of the Giants. And Luffy wants to be King of the Pirates. And sure, I, I like vaguely understand what King of the Pirates is. But then like, what is Soul King? Like, what is King of the Giants? What kind of titles are we embedding ourselves with that these characters are fighting so hard to achieve? And sure, this random giant fighting in the Colosseum wants to be King of the Giants, but I think that Usopp should kind of get that title. He seems like the closest person that I could think of to getting that title, considering every single event that he's had with giants. And look, there's a lot of like weird people in the Colosseum, right? There's like Bartholomew, who um, apparently is called the cannibal, but as a lot of comments told me, it is apparently more of a metaphorical cannibalism, which <laughs> makes sense. It is more like a troll or a prankster or like a ha ha, I got you, I'm getting under your skin kind of situation with him. And yeah, that makes sense. In a lot of his moments, he's really just offending literally everyone in the Coliseum. Cavendish was also a strange one for me because to me, he was already a pretty good character. He was like this suave, uh, wannabe pretty boy who just wanted to get a lot of attention. But then, for some reason, we decided to add another trait to him, which is the fact that when he sleeps, he, he lets the dogs out. He just, he goes like full uh, angry destruction mode. And I don't know, I, I find that weird from a storytelling perspective. I don't think it added anything to the story. I don't know if we really needed it in the story. Not that I hate it, it's just like a weird, 
like a side thing that we add just for the sake of like adding a little bit of lore to a character, you know? Even if I, I don't think he needed it. I think Cavendish is, Cavendish is fine. So one of the things I'm noticing with One Piece is that it's starting to struggle with balancing character screen time. We had uh, Nami who had kind of a big moment in Fishman Island. Sanji had kind of a character beat in Dressrosa. Brooke and Chopper got completely sidelined in this arc. At least, you know, at least Brooke uh, got to take down the art lady. But what did Chopper do? Chopper was uh, just around for Dressrosa. And so as the story is progressing, we kind of just push Brooke and Chopper and Sanji and Nami all off to Zo uh, or Zhao or Zhao. What are those? I don't, I don't know. I haven't heard anyone pronounce it yet. Anyways, I'm starting to notice the struggle of trying to maintain and have everyone in the spotlight all at once. I think it's difficult to do with so many characters and just so many more characters in Dressrosa. I think it is in part due to the structure of the new world where we seem to have very few arcs. Like we don't have those smaller micro arcs leading into a big saga like in Alabasta. Instead, we have every character at once thrown into a big saga, followed by yet another big saga. For example, I don't think Brooke has gotten a lot of screen time. I think Robin and Frankie have also just gotten less and less screen time after Ennis Lobby. Not to say that we're not wanting to put characters into the spotlight. I think Sanji, uh, at the end of Dress Rosa, got the only wanted alive poster. And I find that weird, especially when he's the only character that we've seen have that so far. So I don't think we're forgetting characters as much as we're trying to just figure out how and when to give these characters some really good moments. I think the wanted only alive is a really good setup for stuff like that. I think this leads into a lot of different potential like storylines that you could, you could like take this anywhere. In terms of character spotlight, I think that like Zoro and Pika is a good example. It's another fight that like I didn't talk about in the review because it was a cool fight. Like I like seeing Zoro slice up a person made out of stone. Don't get me wrong. But I didn't talk about it because it didn't feel like it really added much to the narrative, to the overall story of One Piece. He took down what I like to call like a fodder villain, which is every villain that doesn't add anything to the narrative or isn't a main antagonist. And unlike Usopp, which got like a character beat of him being a coward and then being a brave warrior, or Robin, who also got a very subtle character beat, like we barely showed it. She helped Rebecca from debris that was falling, and when she went to go see her father, Robin stayed back, and we could see that her back was just covered in blood, but she didn't try to bring attention to it. And so it's this a very amazing, very subtle moment that we don't really linger on. We had the Luffy versus Bellamy fight, which was equally heartbreaking as it was just thematically relevant to the overall arc. And for Zoro versus Pika, um, it it was a fight. It was a fight. I think for the Zoro versus Pika fight, we're not diving into the story or the character arcs, but instead we're diving into the lore. We saw like a small flashback in which he encoded or uh, infused his sword with hockey, which is cool. But as to what the coding does, nothing really changed about his fighting style. He, uh, he hits harder, slices more. I didn't think it was worth bringing up. I don't, I don't know. That's it. So I think this arc was a major lesson in the fact that we are juggling for screen time. And with that said, I think it was a good idea that the contestants of the Coliseum helped out the Straw Hats and then later became members of the Straw Hat fleet and then later became members of the Straw Hat fleet. I like how Luffy said no. I think it helps keep a very hard line between what is a crew member of the Straw Hat and then what is like a fleet member that helps out the Straw Hat. I think this keeps the cast very small and allows Luffy to go and ask people to be a part of his crew. But it also can lead to a Marine Ford situation where Whitebeard gets to summon his entire fleet, except now it's Luffy and now it's the, uh, fleet members of the Straw Hats. I don't remember what they were called. I forgot immediately. It's a very cool idea. I don't know if they're ever going to get like a lot of screen time again, but at the very least, there is potential for them to get like one epic reveal moment or one very big character beat where they're all helping them out and they shift the tides and everything's cool. Yeah. 
So with Awakened Devil Fruit abilities now extending past Zoan types, I want to talk about Devil Fruit some more because Devil Fruits are these like really weird and mysterious things, right? A lot of comments mentioned that back in Punk Hazard, you can see Devil Fruits going in and replacing real fruits. So the Maramaranomi was probably somewhere nearby in Marineford. But to me, this only creates more questions. Right now, we are showing fruits moving forward in the process. We are seeing them go from a host to a fruit to a host. But this logic becomes very weird when we move backwards. It's like a chicken and the egg situation, right? Because either we go far back enough to the point where only fruits existed, which had to come from somewhere other than people, or they appeared from a devil or some kind of creature or some kind of person with abilities who then transferred upon their death their soul and or abilities onto a fruit. Because here's the thing, right? You can't, you can't explain devil fruits without also having an explanation for how Blackbeard obtains multiple fruits, why devil fruits awaken in the first place, why they seemingly have a connection to the ocean and water in some way, and why smile fruits are seemingly easier to create when they're zoan types. One Piece has dipped its feet into a lot of pre-existing cultures and mythos, and here we got like the Adam and Eve trees, we got Noah's Ark, we got Devil Fruits, so there is a lot of uh, directions here that we're pulling from, and yet we are not specific enough to answer anything. In part because for me, every answer I come up with kind of makes sense until I bring up one other aspect. Like, oh yeah, how does this work with like the whole ocean thing? Why are they weak to water? I don't, I don't know. Uh, and then I was like, oh, animals awaken? That, that makes sense. That makes sense. And it's like, no, all the fruits can awaken. And I'm like, all right, now I don't get it anymore. Uh, <laughs> But I will say that I do ultimately enjoy the fact that this is always a background element. It's not something that's always focused on. So there's just a lot of questions to how Devil Fruits, as well as the rest of the One Piece world, operates. But then the story can go, hey, who cares? We're on a journey around the world. We'll figure all that stuff out later. So one of the things that we saw from this arc was the fact that Law's energy got drained from using the fruit ability which is apparently something that can drain enough of your energy for it to start affecting your health. In my Dress Rosa review, I was wondering why didn't Doflamingo ever use a lot of his abilities? And a lot of comments were mentioning that maybe that is one of the reasons why he couldn't use his puppeteering abilities. It was either uh, too draining or not strong enough to hold on to enemies. And I think that's a pretty reasonable reason. I don't know how this affects characters like Luffy or Candle Guy, um, like Mr. Three or, or Chopper. Characters who seemingly always have their devil fruits on. I don't know. I just thought it was like a general exhaustion from fighting when they're using these abilities. But the ability actually draining stamina is pretty interesting. It is a very soft power system, which, which I get. It's, it's adding stakes. I don't know if you would ever see a character be like, oh, I can't use my fire ability because I'm tired. It's on a cooldown. I could see other series doing that. I could see a power system based around trying to maintain a set amount of mana or stamina, <laughs> but not One Piece. I guess while we talked about Doflamingo, we could talk about his abilities, right? Because I think we could all agree there is like a vibe to Doflamingo where Crocodile relies on like a war breaking out and trying to set off a bomb, where like Moria relies on shadow puppets that didn't really work out that well for him. Doflamingo uh, essentially cheated. He didn't need to even gaslight Dressrosa because he had sugar, which was insanely powerful with what she was capable of. And then on top of that, he had his cage ability as a backup. That was like his nuclear option. Because as far as I understand it, he wasn't going to let anyone escape. He was trying to kill anything and everything. It had the scope of something like Akainu or Okiji's fight back in Punk Hazard, where their abilities could do massive AoE damage. And so the cage is literally just like a crane designed to crush literally everything in its path. I'm surprised that wasn't, maybe that is an awakening. I'm surprised if it's not an awakening. Like imagine if Law made like a room that big. That's crazy. I love that when the cage drops down, all hell breaks loose. There's like animals running around everywhere. There's pirates pillaging the town, which why would they do that by the way? 
like after they finish pillaging, aren't they also going to die to the cage? But to be fair, I don't know. They're pirates. Pirates be pirates. That actually kind of fits in with something that would happen. While we're talking about Doflamingo, I want to talk about the flashback where we saw Doflamingo trying to grow his shop. First is just how much of a reach he had underground. We saw a huge thriving market below Dress Rosa. We saw the military, the fact that he's like selling weapons to everyone, trying to spark up wars. There was also Punk Hazard in which we see that he has a lot of connection. But also we kind of get to see the scale of his operation. In the flashback, we see maps of uh, locations that he's been scouting. One of which heads directly to the start of the Grand Line. Kind of like how Crocodile had Whiskey Peaks. Doflamingo could have easily planned to have a shop right at the start of the Grand Line. He sold uh, probably small fruits, weapons, and who knows what else. It creates more parallels between Crocodile and Doflamingo, but I think it also gives us a nice insight to his strategy of building more and more connections. And so, even if Doflamingo did get KO'd, what fascinated me about all of this is seeing all of his reach. It's fascinating to see that even once he's lost, he kind of seems like the person who thinks he was holding everything together. He was kind of like the last line of defense before everything broke loose. All the people that were allied with Doflamingo are now antagonized with the Straw Hats. We also have Kaido getting ready for the big war. Um, one of the things that I also didn't mention, just because it was like one page long and I had almost nothing to work off of, was Rob Lucci. But I just, he's there. He's there. And there's the other guy, the, the other guy who, who even remembers his name? Who cares? Anyways, one of the interesting parts about the introduction of Rob Lucci was the fact that now he's the one that's taking charge over the situation. He's now part of CP0. He talks about a ton of resources that were taken from Dress Rosa being stolen uh, probably by the Revolutionary Army. And so we see that we're kind of building a conflict here between maybe CP0 or just the entire world government and the Revolutionary Army, which now seems to have added a bunch of resources. I do also want to lightly mention Zengoku, which is dressed up in a rather vacation-esque attire. And I dig it! Anyways, him and a lot of other marines gathered around Dress Rosa, and we get to see Sengoku split off from the main group for a second to talk to Law and have this really heart-to-heart -heart moment where they ironically uh, talk about Corazon, uh, Rosiante. And I really like Sengoku. He seems to have like a really interesting worldview when it comes to being a part of the Marines. We saw how he reacted with Shanks back in Marineford in a lot more of a level-headed manner. And in Dress Rosa specifically, we see how he raised and cared for Rosiante and eventually saw him die. And we get to see him just sobbing his eyes out. It was this very real but small moment in this otherwise big arc. One of the things that got me specifically was the fact that he decided to raise Rosiante as his own family, which of course brings up a lot of the found family themes of the story, but it also kind of reminds me of Garp, who similarly wanted to raise kids and wanted them to become Marines. Did that happen? Not exactly, but someone in the One Piece world was able to do that. Not Garp, but someone! And lastly, I just want to talk about the pacing of One Piece, because I feel like there is a shift in storytelling. I think as time goes on, we are getting less and less of what I'm going to call exploration One Piece. What I mean by that is, I don't know if we're going to have another arc like Skypea. I don't know if we're going to have moments where the crew just stumbles on this weird island with Gaimund. At the start of the series, there were some goals like defeat Mihawk and every other warlord, uh, find the One Piece, fight Yonkos. But as to how that actually happened, it felt very vague. It could happen within this arc. It could happen within 500 arcs. Now, though, it feels like there's a lot more tension, right? I want to say that the start of the series was around East Blue to Skypea. The kind of mid-phase was from Water 7 to post-war. And only in Dress Rosa did I realize that we're kind of already at the start of the end game, uh, probably since Fishman Island. And from there, we seem to be cutting out a lot of the smaller arcs and instead focusing on like big, hefty, impactful plus 50 chapter arcs. I'm not against it. It's just a different form of storytelling. Um, anyways, I'm going to go read Zhao. Zhou?
Zhao. I'm gonna I'm gonna go read one of those. Thanks to my patrons who uh, are silently judging and sometimes not so silently judging how I pronounce a lot of these arcs. I'll get it right. I'll watch I'll watch and hear how they pronounce it, I swear. Again, I made an entire review of Dressrosa which dives more into the themes and the character arcs of the story if you wanna see that. And maybe I'll make like smaller One Piece videos in the future where I'm just rambling more and more about what I'm currently reading as I build up to bigger and bigger reviews of the arc. I don't know. Maybe you'll like that. I don't know. Tell me.